sheet for today. Okay. So, uh, welcome again. And um, as always, we begin, Benum Christ in it. I, I greet Christ in you and I welcome you back today. Our opening prayer um, echoes a bit of the themes we've been looking at and that we'll be exploring this morning. So we begin, let us pray. Clothe me, O Lord, in a garment of kindness. Dress me in the robes of compassion. Place upon my feet the sandals of endurance and a ring upon my finger as a testament of your love. But above all, O God, put upon me the garment of Christ that clothed in his divinity I may become fully human. Amen. So that brings us to uh, our next reading from Contemplating Christ, which spans pages uh, 73 and 74. Just so, in, as I was preparing this morning, in order to maintain the integrity of the, of the themes here, I, I've taken a more than one paragraph, so you'll forgive the length of our readings today, just to try to keep us uh, in the same ballpark. So we're talking about um, a, an interpretation of the story of the uh, prodigal son as we see it in Luke 15, um, as a retelling of the story of humanity in exile through the lens of the incarnation. So uh, what I'm paralleling here is the dynamic of the story of the father and the prodigal son, as it's called, and that of Adam and Eve, both as a, as a kind of exile and return, as it were. So we're at the place in the story where the son has prepared a speech, an apology in the midst of the famine uh, that has struck the land in the parable, but which the early fathers understood as really a famine within his own heart, a famine of intimacy um, with, with his father in this case. And so he, he prepares a speech, a rehearsal, and uh, uh, makes his way home uh, at the time when his father sees him, he rushes out to greet him while he's still on the way. And that's where we're picking up this morning. So it is striking that the father ignores his son's rehearsed speech, as we see in verse 22, and never utters a word of forgiveness. Instead, forgiveness is embodied. Adorning his son with the best robe, a ring on his finger, and sandals on his feet. Much as God clothed Adam and Eve at the beginning of their exile, here too the father clothes his son not to send him out into the world, but to bring him home. As if to signal the end of humanity's exile in Christ, we see again a theology of dress by which the father transforms his son from vagabond to heir as he dons him with the finest of clothing. This is reflective of the son's true identity, indeed dignity, as child and heir of the Father. This is what it means to put on Christ, to be deified. And this is no private matter, but a communal affair. The items lavished on the Son bring about the restoration of his dignity and his reintegration into the community. Union with God always entails a deeper experience of union with others as if to contrast his isolation in a distant land of exile, the father calls for his servants to prepare a feast for his son who was dead, but is alive again. Exile, it turns out, is self-imposed. Self-alienation carries its own penalty. Reconciliation then is not about God overcoming a grudge, but about the restoration 
of an individual to the community that makes them whole. And that leads us to our meditation this morning. And let us Amen. So our second reading follows uh, on pages 74 and 75. The divine human reconciliation wrought through the incarnation simultaneously opens the way for the self alienated individual to be remembered as an extension of the body of Christ. To remember is to be membered again. Should we find ourselves isolated from the community of faith, we ask Christ to remember us as did the thief on the cross. Jesus, remember me when you come into your kingdom. That is to say, make us members again of your one body. Our fractured selves are made whole again, unified and revivified in Christ. Our illusions of separation are overcome the more deeply we realize ourselves as members of Christ's body. As Paul says, now you are the body of Christ and individually members of it. The observation by some commentators that Luke's parable is theologically problematic for failing to equate the Father's forgiveness with the sacrificial death of Jesus misses the point. As T.W. Manson observes, the point is that the love of God revealed in Christ precedes human repentance. This is the meaning of Paul's statement that God proves his love for us in that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. However, early patristic theologians like Irenaeus and Peter Grisogolus would go further to see the fatted calf slaughtered in verse 23 as a symbol of Christ offered up in celebration of the union between father and son, between God and humanity. So our closing prayer this morning. Oh God, remember me that I may be remembered as Christ's body on earth, as Christ's peace, which the world cannot give, as Christ's voice singing your praise, as Christ's love for all living things. Amen. And that brings us to our sacred sharing this morning. So good morning and welcome back. Um, as always, um, you have the floor. If there's anything uh, you'd like to start with by, by way of clarification or comments, questions. Michael, please, good morning. Good morning, Vincent. This uh, reading today was so, so powerful to me um, in that I looked at it in a whole different way for the first time. 
Mm. And that was that, that I was a prodigal son in, to a degree in my youth. Now, I was not in the gutter. Uh, I did not lose everything I had. But I was isolated from my parents, my family. Uh, and this was uh, primarily through my alcoholism and drug use. And that, that cut me off. That isolated me from all that was open around me. I, I felt like it connected me because in, in ways I felt it made me more social, et cetera. <clears throat> but it was false. It didn't. It really cut me off. And uh, I, I went to churches and, and whenever things were bad, I turned to God and I could feel and know the presence and there was never the judgment. The judgment was only my own. And uh, my parents always accepted me, no matter what. Uh, at the same time, 40 some odd years ago, my wife and I and our, our first child and then second child found St. Columbus. And I had never felt and found a community quite the same. Uh, I had been in big churches and in big groups and there was camaraderie and there was etc. However, not not the same as as what has, happens here at St. Columbus. And we have watched St. Columbus rise and ebb in various forms and situations and priests and parishes and people. And here we are in the rise of another really, really wonderful growing and glowing. And um, I feel so, both Thelma and I feel so connected to everybody, everybody here, people now across the United States and other countries that we meet through you and your services. And, and I just feel so fed. It also brought to my mind, living out here, it brought to my mind uh, the interconnection of the rest of the earth that we dismiss, the trees which are connected through the mycelium throughout the earth that feed and nurture and communicate with each other though we, we don't really realize it. Right. And just how we do that in the body of Christ is right. the mycelium and this, yeah. It's just so wonderful. Thank you, Michael. I appreciate that. And you know, the thread that I hear kind of weaving uh, throughout all that you just shared is um, so connected to this idea of the uh, story of the prodigal son, but also to so many of the gospel narratives, which we've kind of begun to take for granted because we've hear, we, you know, we've heard them so many times, but how often healing, uh, the restoration of health in some way, even, you know, as we hear very frequently in Mark's gospel, a lot of demonic possessions um, or, or exorcisms from those possessions, there's this movement from isolation to community, isolation to community. And there's this, there's just this common pattern that the more intimate we are with oneself, with God, the more intimate we are with community, that these two things are, are unidirectional in the same direction, not, not opposite one another. Um, and that so often it's those patterns, whatever they may be in your own life, you talked about, you know, the alcoholism that, um, that in, in fact, you, you know, you've nailed it doesn't um, it function as a social lubricant, as a way to connect, but really ultimately as a way to disconnect from self, um, which then does not allow anything authentic to grow out of that. And the, the way through it is being held by loving community, right? And connecting and being remembered as a member of that community. So I would just invite you all to pay close attention as we you know, hear gospel stories throughout the given year, uh, how, how true that thread is from uh, you know, isolation, social stigma, separation to societal integration, communal affirmation and, and ministry and service. Um, those movements are almost universal in these stories. So thanks, Michael, for your sharing on that. Uh, Nicola, good morning. Good morning, Father Vincent. <laughs> uh, can we talk more about that last paragraph? Can you unpack that? I really <laughs> didn't understand it. Sure, you mean this one here? Yeah. Yes. Right. Um, so when I was researching, you know, um, 
about this, there, what I've observed was that there were a lot of commentators who felt that this parable in a certain sense failed on the level of talking about reconciliation between humanity and God here symbolized in reconciliation between father and son, right? That the, that the parable failed to incorporate the so-called sacrificial dimension of the cross, that somehow the cross represents God's self-sacrifice on behalf of humanity. And the, the commentators asked, well, where is that element of salvation? Where is the cross in this story, essentially, uh, that we sort of center um, the notion of salvation around? And what I argue is that that's asking too much of the parable. Um, that's not the point of the parable. That's not what Jesus was telling the parable for. That um, that the real point is here. And we see this um, reiterated in, in some of the beautiful texts we see from Paul, that the incarnation, God doesn't come to humanity after we've perfected ourselves. God comes in the midst of a broken world. Right. So the father doesn't wait at home for the son to arrive, which is, in a sense, we could call that spiritual enlightenment. Right. Him making his way home on that hero's journey. But the beauty of the incarnation is that the love of God revealed in Christ precedes our repentance, just the way the father rushing out to meet the son doesn't wait for an apology, doesn't wait for him to arrive home. It's a God who we might say is out of control with his love for us and can't resist coming and grabbing us before we've had a chance to make it home. And that the, the idea of the cross as a, as a requirement for that, I think sees, puts the cross before the incarnation. And I think that that's a mistake. And so where Paul says in his letter here in Romans, God proves his love for us that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us, right? The father goes out to greet the son before the apology, won't even hear the apology, doesn't wait for him to come home. There's an urgency on behalf of God in this parable that I think speaks to the urgency of God's inbreaking into human existence, not after the world perfected itself, but precisely to bring it to that place of perfection because of God's love. And that's what I'm trying to suggest. And then to sort of appease those who would argue, well, we need somewhere a sacrificial notion here, right? Uh, <laughs> I, I look back early, uh, you know, P Peter Chrysologus, who was himself a bishop, uh, talks about um, the fatted calf in the story as the symbol one might say, of Christ offered up. Uh, if one needs to go there, that's fine. I don't think Jesus implied that necessarily, but it doesn't mean one couldn't see in that somehow resonance or metaphors for sacrificial you know, uh, theology there. I just don't think that's what Christ had in mind. Yeah. Does that make sense, Nicola? That's what I'm trying to suggest there. Yes, thank you. You're welcome. Okay, um, let's see, just let me call up my participant list. I'll see who the order here is. Sharon, I think you were next. Yes, hi, Father Vincent. Hi. Um, I'm gonna risk some real vulnerability here. So sure. vulnerability alert. <laughs> <laughs> um, this part about union with God always entails a deeper experience of union with others. And this whole paragraph I have underlined quite a bit because it's really an answer to a prayer for me to see something differently with a person that I'm really alienated from. Mm -hmm. And it's kind of like we've exiled each other from each other. <laughs> and, um, and I see how that is self-imposed on both ends. And, um, that the reconciliation then is not about overcoming a grudge. So sometimes I feel like I've just been waiting for myself to keep uh, going into deeper and deeper levels of overcoming some grudge or resentment towards the person. Um, part of the centering prayer process really helps that stuff to kind of unload. And, um, but the idea that this could be used as a recipe and not as uh, an attachment to an outcome. You know, if I can just come from a self that isn't so fractured, if I could become whole myself again 
and come to this relationship out of that place, that that's all that I can do. And that for me, it is an answer to a prayer on how to see this differently. Because what I'm seeing is that I'm feeling compassion for both of us. And that, um, you know, that only through Christ can this be healed. I have no control over the outcome, but I can heal myself and my resentment. And I can hold this differently and just pray for God to do what God's going to do with it. And so this has been an amazing answer to a prayer and also my recipe for how to go forward. Thank you. You're welcome, Sharon. Yeah, glad it makes me feel good to know that that helps you in that way. You know, and, and I'll point out, you know, thanks for your vulnerability on that. I think we can all relate to, um, to this idea. So first of all, you know, let's be clear that forgiveness and reconciliation are two very different things. If you can forgive on your own, it, reconciliation requires both parties to come to terms with their own wrongdoing, their own capacity to have inflicted harm on the other and to own up to it and to, you know, and to want to make it right. Um, so we can't require reconciliation, but we also don't have to require reconciliation to forgive. Um, because we can just hold out that forgiveness in our hearts. And I want to also, you know, say, I think, I think too often we've heard Christianity preached as kind of behavior modification. We're like, okay, now you have to forgive this person. But what we often don't address is the interior reality of, yeah, but there's still resentment there. There's still animosity, I feel. There's still anger. There's still venom. There's still hurt. You know, there's still woundedness. What am I supposed to do with all that if we're really just talking on the surface level about behavior modi modification? And Christianity, I think, has to get serious about not having the fact of those lingering resentments we can feel when somebody has repeatedly been abusive, repeatedly hurt us, repeatedly you know, whether those are entrenched social systems, like we're dealing with racism and we see the trauma of how racism has hurt, has affected generations of people, or whether this is um, individuals, like, you know, interpersonal relationships on whatever level, there's real feelings there. There's a real lived experience there that we can't simply dismiss if we're going to be authentic in the world. So somehow, I think, we have to A, be able to distinguish what's in my power and what isn't. And what is in my power is to forgive. What isn't in my power is to snap my fingers and change my feelings for a person or to reconcile, which requires some goodwill on their part as well, uh, you know, some goodwill measure. So does forgiveness mean that I instantly stop harboring um, negative thoughts, feelings, or emotions when this person comes into mind or heart. I, I think it's unfair to expect that. I think it's unrealistic psychologically and emotionally. And I think worse, we shouldn't be then spiraling into a, into a feeling of guilt because I have a feeling, right? Remember Martin Laird's association, which I think we've talked about here. It's so very helpful, his analysis, that distinguishing the mountain, which is what we are, grounded in divine in the divine ground and weather, which is ephemeral, fleeting, passing. Today it's sunny, tomorrow it's stormy. Our mistake is to identify with the weather, right? I'm angry, I'm resentful, right? I'm happy, I feel peaceful. What he says is in our meditation, we learn to just let the weather be what the weather is and we don't cling to it. We remember we are the mountain, we're grounded, unmovable in faith. So what I encourage you to do, rather than just try to get yourself into this weird cycle of, you know, external appearance of forgiveness, whatever that looks like, while still harboring resentment or seething with, you know, toxicity around hurts and wound, is to, is to cultivate instead, as best you can, um, a, a degree of compassion for the person in question or the group of people in question. Um, by understanding their own woundedness on some level, which takes a lot sometimes for us to be able to stretch beyond their, their own sort of 
negative, hostile behavior and to really see behind that a degree of woundedness. And then allow yourself to understand that the resentment or the anger or whatever you still feel is weather and don't attach to it, but don't try to pretend you don't feel it either. Don't try to repress it. It's not going to get you anywhere. Mm -hmm. and allow that weather to pass as you remind yourself, I am the mountain and I am grounded in Christ and I can pray for this person. I can wish them goodwill. I can refrain from any actions, petty or otherwise, that would hurt or damage or make their lives difficult. And allow that manure, as it were, to become fertilizer, but allow yourself the truth of knowing that Christianity is about transforming those interior feelings over time in our prayer and so forth, not just an external action that gives the appearance that everything is okay now, when in fact it isn't. Yeah, that's so helpful. And I think what I really struck me is that for the first time, I didn't read this as something that was so deep in me, but as more like a mirror of the person and how my um, being more like the father, uh, what I tend to do because of the resentment is I kind of overlook the very small little things that are done that might be conciliatory that I'm not, right. I'm not paying attention to. Um, so to be come from that place of the father of really acknowledging that instead of the other is just, you know, kind of like a practice I could <laughs> And so this has been really great just to have like a window into the other person's psychology that might be their woundedness is causing right. them to behave this way. And I can feel total compassion. To yeah, that, exactly. Looking at how hard it is for me. <laughs> right. <Yeah>. Right. <laughs> and it's very easy for us to ask the question in our minds, you know, who is our Pharaoh in life? Who is that oppressive, dominating, hurtful for whatever reason in various times? But but it's a, we have to also cultivate in all honesty, to whom are we Pharaoh? And what does that look like, right? It's a very important question. And this is, you know, the whole log and speck in your eye. I mean, there's, there's food within the gospels for us to sort of chew on that helps to sort of ground us in A, the awareness where the mountain, the weather is gonna come and go. The trick is not to attach to it and worse, not to act out of it. So I can feel a certain degree of anger that may be residual because I just don't know how to let go of it or because the wounds are deep. But then how do we learn and cultivate a way of not responding from that place, but as you're saying, from a deeper place of compassion, even while those feelings are still there, right? Yeah. And over time, I do think that that's where real transformation can begin to take place. Otherwise, we just play the game of repression. We think we've dealt with it and it's really seething underneath and that's not good for anybody. Exactly, thank you. Yeah. You're welcome. Uh, Pat, sorry for the wait. <laughs> oh, that's fine. Good morning, Father Vincent. Good morning. Um, I was really struck also by that. The point is the love of God revealed in Christ precedes human repentance. Um, at least in my own experience with churches, it's been so much reversed. Uh, you know, the re has to be the repentance first. Um, remember that you are sinners, not that God forgave you. Um, and in a way that, you know, seems to mirror our human nature of, you know, wanting to hear that um, I'm sorry from someone who has hurt us before we are willing to forgive and being so incredulous when we hear stories of um, forgiveness of a perpetrator of a mass shooting, say that, you know, um, the Amish uh, children, school situation and things of that nature. Um, so, yeah, I guess I'm really, you know, observing more or less that, um, a tendency to put our own, you know, fallen human um, inclination on what we think or expect of God. Right. And, and which tends to limit I think, God because we tend to um, 
I think we tend to keep, you know, casting God in our image with all the attending limitations of that. And part of the, I think the real um, gift of Christianity in its, in what it, what it offers the world in terms of our understanding of God is, is precisely this notion of, um, uh, of a forgiveness that even precedes repentance, that God's in by God's very nature just is forgiving. And that, that doesn't necessarily mean there's no accountability um, in this kind of wishy-washy sense where everything is okay and there's no sense of justice. But the idea is that um, if, if, we can, if we can begin to receive the gospel as good news, as forgiveness preceding repentance in my own life, it becomes the, the very ground out of which we live Eucharistically as Christians, meaning out of a place of gratitude. That's what Eucharist means, gratitude. So the, the fundamental Christian response to the divine is, is a response lived in gratitude. And when we get that, that really can begin to shift our own understanding of expectations. I've often counseled people when somebody has done something that you find hurtful, for a moment, let's stick with an uh, interpersonal relationships rather than things that are uh, necessarily social or gener intergenerational, which I think brings us to a very different level of what that looks like. But I think on an interpersonal level, um, what happens, I think, is we end up repeating the offense in our minds, yeah. right? We keep reliving it. And that creates a certain revivification of the venom we feel or the anger or the the rage or the hurt right so we keep it alive even as that moment continues to recede in the past and then we, what we end up doing is creating a situation where we keep that person stuck in that moment doing that thing that was so hurtful to us right but in reality the event doesn't exist anymore the comment, the action, the behavior is over. It's, it's, it's done. What does exist is the person. And very often we get stuck, I think, in a, in a rut of trying to forgive the thing they did rather than forgive the person themselves. That's what's alive in the present moment. An individual who is here in front of you now, right? Whether they're capable of acknowledging it or reconciling is, is up to them. But your ability to look at them as a human being in the here and now, even as the thing they did that was so hurtful, doesn't even exist anymore. You're keeping it alive in your memory. You're keeping it alive by telling yourself the story over and over again. Can we release that narrative as a past event and instead look this person in the eye and see somehow the face of Christ, however marred, however wounded, however hidden? And then think about forgiving what it means to forgive the person rather than the thing, if that makes any sense. I have found in my own life that distinction has become helpful because I realize how much of that is me replaying something that I found hurtful, even though the person has moved on or has tried to move on and so on. Thank you. Hi, Christine. Hello, Father. Good morning. Good morning. I'm just so struck. I, I, until I read your book, I never saw this parallel between the exile in the garden and the story of Adam and Eve and how this, <laughs> this is such a perfect complement to that. Um, and I do see the crucifixion in it. I see the crucifixion for the father in his dying to his, in his sense of uh, righteous anger towards both uh, children. And so there again, I think it's a perfect fit. And thank mm. you for, for your seeing this and writing it. Thank you so much. You're welcome, Christine. The funny thing is, I didn't see the parallel until I wrote about it. <laughs> it kind of came to me when I was reflecting. So I was like, hey, wait a minute, this looks awfully familiar. Um, but really trying to see that difference. Um, and, and, and one of the, the elements that I thought was so beautiful, which I bring out 
I think it was today, um, is the is that beautiful but simple and easily overlooked aspect of God sewing clothes for Adam and Eve to send them out into the world, yeah. and then the father dressing the son to bring him back. I thought this is such a beautiful uh, parallel of re in reverse, um, and so we were on that theology of dress, as it were. But yeah, it's really quite striking as I start, you know, once it clicked and I began exploring the parallels, I thought it was really beautiful and worth thinking through um, in that way. So thank you for acknowledging that. Brilliant, brilliant. Thanks, <laughs> thank you. <laughs> Hi there, Sue. Good morning. Good morning. Um, I don't know why I'm feeling nervous about this, but... Um, at the church that I am a member of here, they asked for a Lenten study to be looking at non-judgment and forgiveness. Mm. So I've been reflecting on that from what I would call like a Christian perspective and also from the Course in Miracles, oh. which I have been quite an active sort of follower or practitioner of. And... Um, we were looking at, or I was looking at, forgiveness is only necessary after there's been, or if there's been condemnation and judgment. If there's been no condemnation or judgment, there's no need for forgiveness. It doesn't actually even have a purpose if there's completely no condemnation. And um, so it is offered in the Course in Miracles <laughs> And when I first heard it, I thought, what the hell is that? It says, because I heard that it says, God does not forgive. And I thought, what? And then it's because I, do, I can't quote it verbatim, but God does not condemn. God does not condemn. So therefore, well, there is no need. Forgiveness seemingly, like you could say that forgiveness does not even exist in the mind of God, mm. because God does not see anything apart from innocence or love. Now it feels quite a leap in my mind to, to be like that myself. So I can understand <laughs> that forgiveness is given for someone like myself who isn't um, quite seeing everyone as innocent and loving everyone unconditionally, including myself. So I can see the purpose of forgiveness. But um, this whole thing about forgiving someone else, and I really appreciate what you said, is like if I'm keeping a hurt or a grievance going in my mind, and the, the event is like done, um, ultimately I, I just need to forgive myself for keeping that judgment and that condemnation going. And, and and when I'm stuck in that, because I want to keep the grievance going, that's when I really need to pray for help. And that's the kind of repetition we do in this storytelling in our head. Yeah, and just looking, you know, I'm, am I willing to let this go? If I'm not, well, God can't do anything. <laughs> so I have to offer that willingness. But I just really wanted to sort of put that out there. And um, yeah. Uh, so I, I wonder, you know, it, I, and, and I want to ask a question, and it's not intended as a challenge to that idea, which is provocative, but in some ways also very beautiful. But uh, it, I would want to sit with it for a while to try to understand. But one of the half-formed questions that are arising, and I wonder if either Course in Miracles or in your own experience, how you might respond to that. If we say that there's no, like, judgment in God, um, and, and therefore no forgiveness, which in itself strikes me as a, a beautiful concept. W what do we do with, um, how do we're, are we to understand the divine response to the atrocities of human history, to systemic racism, to the Holocaust, to various genocides, uh, you know, ongoing injustices, to, is, does God not have a kind of 
judgment against that in favor of the anawim, to use the Old Testament term, the oppressed, the poor, those who are victimized by these structures or society. Does there, and, and this is truly not an intent to push back, but to really understand what that would look like in that case. Do you, do, have you, have you come to something like that? I, well, yeah, of course, <laughs> you know, it's like, um, because it feels very radical or whatever we want to label it, it's, there's, there's, in my mind, there's always like, yes, but, there's always a yes, but, right, yes, right. but what about this? Yes, but what about that? And um, so I don't, I can't say that I could answer your question. Um, but the only thing that, that helps me is, um, I suppose it's coming to now, like now. Okay, there are things that are of the past, just like you said, there are things that have happened. What about now? And God, show me now what is, like how to see this. I can't answer those questions myself. The ego can't work it out. It wants to try and work it out or the false self. And, um, and the only thing that helped me just personally is, um, yeah, because, is that the belief in separation is the is is the basically the only problem <laughs> so if i believe that i am separate and that there are two then that means attack is possible if i believe if i really can see that i share the same being with the whole world <laughs> then that if there is just one being, one body of Christ, on on some level, which is more than the level of form in the world, attack is impossible. I mean, it's really sort of like, oh, I, um, sometimes it's like, oh, that just sounds, that just feels so good, that attack is impossible, that love is the only true reality with a capital R because the only thing that is real is something that is eternal mm -hmm. but it does take quite a, a willingness and constant prayer to when I want to try and start analyzing something or working it out I really have to ask for the Holy Spirit to show me but I get yeah, so that's the only thing that's the only way I can feel Thank I can you. respond from my own experience Thanks, Sue. I appreciate that. And I, I do see a few other hands up, so I'll, I'll, I'll move to those questions, but I appreciate your response. Thank you so much. Um, Debbie, please. Hi, thank you. Um, what you see as parallels in scriptures, I see parallels in institutions, traditions, or rituals, like such as the sacraments, of clothed in Christ. When I was, when the first time I heard it, I, I read it over before, but it struck me today, like for confirmations, your child or you, even as an adult, you're usually dressed in white, especially in the Catholic or the Orthodox. I haven't seen as much Protestant as not as uh, close in traditions or rituals as the Orthodox and Catholic, or even like the coronation where a person's coming into priesthood or a bishop, the ring and the pallium and the robes, like it's really quite a dress, dressing. Or in uh, some institutions have what they call initiation of adults. Right. And uh, there's the white sash, or you know how the priest has this, and it's, or the baptism again, the white. So it just so, the symbolism of clothed in Christ is even in our, everyday rituals as uh, like a real strong reminder and uh, like coming home to the father. That's what made me think of the sun running and being closed. So I just thought I first time I just wanted to share us was all these beautiful traditions and rituals that popped up as sacraments and meaningful. Yes. Um, uh, you're right about that. I, I, at some point soon, I think in the book, I will in fact talk about uh, the cowl, the, the contemplative robe uh, that monks wear as a clothing or putting on of Christ on some level and the beauty of that symbolism. 
uh, which is really evocative of being naked rather than clothed. It's to put on Christ is to be naked before Christ again. And it's the voluminous garment of a cow with its hood and its loose long sleeves kind of makes it impossible to do anything else but to kind of sit still in meditation or risk all kinds of clumsy mishaps, as, I, as I'll talk about. So there's a way in which uh, clothing, liturgical garb and all absolutely has deep symbolic meaning in the various traditions. And not only the types of garb we wear, but the colors and all of those things are really an extension of these liturgical traditions, all of which bespeak a kind of theology of dress, as it were, and a beautiful um, aspect of the tradition. But no, Thank you. Uh, you're welcome. It opened my eyes to and that that sun is us, whether we are in that confirmation or whether we're in a coronation, right. being, you know, dressed. I just, thank you very much. It's very beautiful. Thank you, Debbie. I appreciate it. Um, Pat, please. Thank you. Um, I just want to share an observation about this notion of condemnation and judgment. Um, to not condemn is a judgment. We have, you know, God has judged not to condemn, or we have made the judgment not to condemn. So um, just saying not that you know, there can kind of be a warning in a sense not to jump to the conclusion that judgment is always something negative. Well, and, and you know, at some point I talk about the cross as the judgment of judgment, right? Um, itself, that it is, it is, it's the end of judgment on some level. Um, but the we often in, in English have a very negative association with judgment, um, but it comes from the Greek word, word krine, and krine is where we also get the word in English critical, like to be critical of something. Now that could mean just being, to, to be discerning, right? A critical analysis of a, of a biblical yeah. text is, is not a negative thing. It's actually quite a positive thing, but being critical can also imply a negative, like I'm putting you down and I'm being overly harsh with you, right? Um, in my judgment of you. Um, but, but yes, I think it's w worth exploring how we parse this notion of whether or not God judges, what judgment looks like and what, no, what kind of judgment is non-judgment itself. It's probably yeah. all, a, yeah. So thank you for the, yeah. um, and isn't there too the the notion that if if there is no judgment of some sort, how can there be love? Um, I, I would have to actually give that some thought. I'm not sure that in a world without judgment there couldn't be love. If we are anticipating the kingdom to be that place of of pure and total reconciliation between God and humanity, one would assume that the, that the whole eschaton, the whole um, end goal is of, uh, you know, what we call heaven for lack of a better term, which would be love without judgment, one would think, but, but uh, it would appear we're not there yet, <laughs> at least within our own egos. Yeah. Right. But so much of the church has taught that the cross is God's perfect judgment and God's perfect love coming the, yeah. together. Right. Yeah. Right. And uh, something that I'll call later beauty and terror reconciled <laughs> on some level. Right. Okay. Thank you, Pat. I appreciate that. Thank you for your insights. Uh, Christine, sorry, back to you. Yes. Yes. I. What's really helped me with this is hearing stories of near death experiences. Because, you know, those sins that we think are so unforgivable, how do, how do you explain the bombing innocent people, destroying two cities with atomic bombs? But their story is that when they have a life review, they look at everything they ever did. They're not being judged, but they experience all the pain they caused. They experience that themselves. And so I think Hitler must still be experiencing pain beyond this life to see how much pain he caused. I can't think of, uh, of anything that more solves this problem. <laughs> mm. mm -hmm. Well, I, you know, uh, Thomas Merton's beautiful idea that the judgment of God is nothing more than the love of God. And he uses that beautiful idea of the wax seal of a king or a magistrate and who brings the stamp and he basically says when through you know love and compassion that wax is warm what 
what God does in the eschaton or in, in, the, in our own death is to want to em, emboss, em, em, you know, imprint us with that name, that holy name. And where the, the seal, the wax is soft and so receives it. But if it's brittle and hard, that same action of the divine, which is simply to Im, Im, imprint us with the name of God, as Revelation says, um, we're unable to receive it and it sort of crushes us under the weight or it crumbles us because we'd, we, haven't, we haven't developed the receptivity of that love. I mean, again, it's a metaphor, but it's, it, it speaks, I think, Christine, to the notion that the judgment is our own judgment that God simply loves. And whether that love is felt as a searing burning of judgment or a warm embrace is depends on our capacity to receive the same love, right? Perhaps there's something to that. Um, uh, let's see, uh, Joy, please. Yes, good morning, all. Good morning. Um, what I'd like to talk a little bit about is um, in reference to what we were uh, talking about earlier, and that is um, that Pharaoh person that you were talking about. And it seems like there's always one in my life. And uh, no matter where I go, no matter if I'm, no matter what group of people I'm living with, uh, and I've moved a few times in my life, there's always the Pharaoh that appears, you know, and it's my unresolved stuff. And what I've been taught to do in my spiritual journey is to um, pray for that person every single day for absolutely everything that I want for myself in life. And it's usually the things like the fruits of the spirit. And, you know, at first it is really hard to do. It's like I'm bringing myself around and pulling and tugging and making myself sit on the chair and do this kind of prayer and really get to the place where that I'm trying to mean to mean what I'm saying. And I don't mean it at first. Right. It's like, this is a bunch of baloney. But I keep doing it every single day. I keep praying. And, and after a while, there's something happens. There's a little bit of a shift that happens. And at the end of two weeks, I do feel different. It isn't that it's necessarily resolved. Because I believe I'm always going to have the same kind of basic issues throughout my life, but I need to learn to ask for God's help in releasing this stuff. And the releasing has, has um, happened for me in doing this prayer. Thank you, so Joy. That, Joy, that, that's beautiful. And that is precisely, I think, the, the, the way in which emotionally and psychologically, ultimately spiritually, by the cultivation of compassion, the cultivation of love, the cultivation of um, an act of kindness toward a so-called enemy um, uh, begins to counter the narrative in which we get stuck in the past thing that they did that offended us or perhaps ongoing thing that they do because of a personality flaw or something like that or a chemistry and shift between, you know, a chemistry difference between two people. So that is precisely the spiritual work that I think helps indeed for us to begin to move out of the indulgence of just, you know, venom that we might cultivate towards someone into something that is more, um, conducive to to being able to really be and live into a transformed uh, forgiveness yeah thank you it's a beautiful witness to that i appreciate your sharing that uh jennifer hi hi good morning good morning i i wanted to just point out something that's probably fairly obvious but has just been so freeing and helpful to me and just echoing what you said about not only who is Pharaoh in our life, but also to whom are we Pharaoh. And I think that's where so many humans, myself included, we just get so stuck focusing on the Pharaoh in our own lives. And I love how Joy reminds us that, you know, cultivating compassion for Pharaoh is, is a really important part of the journey, but also just, um, 
for me, just constantly being reminded about the log in my own eye, <clears throat> or how am I a pharaoh to others? How am I a terrorist to others? Um, I find remarkably freeing. It's just like a beautiful thing. Um, and I just wanted to share that. <laughs> Yeah, no, Jennifer, thank you. It, it, is, it is helpful because um, we all, I think, can easily tell a narrative about ourselves in which we're always innocent and always, you know, um, the victim. But in, in often the case, there is aspects of things that we do or don't realize we're doing or do more subtly um, that do hurt other people, frankly, uh, or or are dismissive toward them or whatever, even if it's something more passive aggressive than overtly aggressive. Um, and to be able to sort of just acknowledge that, I think you're right, is is freeing because it keeps us in check. I mean, it really does then allow us to, to see that there is no high horse I, I can ride in on here, that I really do um, have the capacity. And very often the things we blame other people for, if we really think hard enough, we have been guilty of at some time in the past, um, even if in a different or lesser degree. Um, but it's there. And the, it's, the, it's that capacity we can recognize in ourselves that I think helps keep us humble in, in our approach to what it means to be merciful to someone else. Humble and and also this is obvious, but just really connected to our shared humanity, which at this time day this in this day and age of so much polarization and condemnation, I think if we can remember our shared humanity, it's a really um, beautiful thing. So. That's a very beautiful thing. Thank you, Jen. Yeah, I appreciate that. <laughs> uh, Richard, hi. Good morning. Hi. Good morning. Last week in scripture arose the symbol of a uh, brass pole and serpent that Moses uh, was made to construct and ensued a conversation about Kundalini and the twin serpents, Ida and Pingala, rising. Uh -huh. And you responded uh, that in Christianity, it is descent rather than ascent. <laughs> Later, I was in the Thomas Keating Chapel with uh, Bishop Mark, and Mark Andrus uh, recommended Monday mornings, 8 o'clock. Uh, he led us in a shamanic journey. He suggested that you might, in this Christian contemplative tradition, uh, journey as a bird. Uh, immediately, I closed my eyes. I became the ibis of my soul, circling and rising, and was met by a descending dove of the eternal, meeting me from the eternal into this, this temporal moment, and I was home. Mm -hmm. and, uh, and I also want to report my feeling of... Mm, when I feel separate, I can tell by a sense of receiving everything as chastisement, a, uh, a, a receiving of my defended self receives everything from a defended wall, listening for what am I doing wrong uh, from uh, a gruff father. Uh, who, uh, who I fought against whom I built barriers. And um, so I can listen for my own sense of rebuff, mistake, self-created rebuff whenever I hear disagreement, uh, as when you said dissent. And so it stuck in my craw and it is a measure of my, when I am separate uh, or it, in that separateness that is so willing to have a wall and, and perceive mm, another as chastising me when it's not even occurring. Mm -hmm. So those two things, those two elements, the, the, home, the home of the eternal dove descending to meet my ascending ibis, 
of my temporal yearning. Mm-hmm. Thank you, Richard. I, I appreciate it. What a beautiful image. Um, it's not surprising that Bishop Mark would have let you in that kind of a, a meditation. He's good at those things. And um, it's a beautiful experience. Your, your, your recollection of this idea that I was referring to of Christian mysticism being one of descent rather than ascent is indeed an important one for us to, to hold in mind that the idea is not that we are striving to ascend to the divine, but that in mirroring the divine descent through the incarnation, we rest in the, the growing uh, consciousness or awareness that God has descended, right, to, to bring us into that union. The Father has rushed out to meet us while we're still on the way. So the very um, uh, action of the divine in the world is one of, you know, metaphorically from heaven descending to earth insofar as heaven is above metaphorically, right? So that's where we get this descent of the divine in Christ, right? God rushes out to meet us, descends, or the beautiful language of, of the ancient Latin talks about the condescension of Christ, which condescension in English, again, carries a negative term, but absolutely not in theology. The condescension of Christ literally means to descend with, con, right, descendare, right? So this this idea of God descends in Christ with humanity, and therefore, insofar as Christ is our exemplar, Christ is our way, that it is the way of the contemplative not to strive to ascend to the divine, that's been done in the incarnation. It's rather to do what Christ did and to descend into the darkness of the world and to be that light for others, right? That that's where our our contemplative life ultimately leads us. That's going to look different for all of us, what that descent into the world looks like. Um, The other side of the tracks, uh, looking at ecological issues and descending into compassion for the world, uh, descending to our our neighbor who's suffering, descending um, to those who are, um, you know, being made to be second class or third class citizens, any any of these ways of descending become the fruit of the contemplative life for the Christian, rather than one in which we just sort of hover in eternal bliss outside of the world, uh, detached from it all. If nothing else, the, the agonizing cry of dereliction on the cross is the cry of a God who suffers with humanity, who descends into the mess and the chaos that we have made, and then in in doing so, raises us up again. It's a beautiful reflection and the, your your idea of the bird in which you're ascending and being met by this, this beautiful um, dove is, is a stunning example of that. Thank you for sharing that vision with us. One more, if I may, about the symbol of the cross, um, which I guess came later into Christian practice. Uh, some say is a logarithmic spiral. If you go from the right side, it's uh, from the short to the next longer uh, uh, stick and I see. longer one. Uh, if you connect a circle, a, a spiral to the ends of the cross, you get a logarithmic spiral. And if you go the other direction, you get a descending spiral. And same in the fish, symbol that you see on bumpers of cars that uh, there there is a mm, caduceus like uh, logarithmic spiral that if you extrapolate that next you have you have the tail of the fish being the smaller um, unit and then logarithmically the next expansion and then the next expansion that these are symbols of the master who has descended and ascended that the mastery is in both that's just that's that's right that's that's right thank you the the, um there's an ancient jewish form of mysticism called merkaba mysticism which uh, merkaba comes from the uh, the hebrew word for a chariot and it 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 actually is named after the ascension of the prophet Elijah on the chariot into heaven. So Merkabah mysticism becomes a, a mimicking of that ascent into heaven. And so 
um, there is that beautiful ascent and descent that we see. We also see that same pattern being revealed in many of the New Testament hymns around Christ, who sort of starts in this pre-existent heaven, descends with humanity, and then ascends again at the end. Um, whether that's the prologue of John's gospel or uh, the Philippians hymn is another example of that, um, where we see that that descent ascent, right? Uh, and that uh, that manner in which those two things are ultimately joined together. Thank you, Richard. So I wanna suggest that in the interest of time, we uh, look at the, um, uh, the uh, what I'd like to show you as a practice for this week and then have see if there's any few discussions we might have about practice in general. Was it last week that I forgot to give a practice altogether? I think I did, I'm sorry for that. So we may not have much to go on, but, um, so let me just call up our practice for the coming week. And that will um, will assist us. So it's brief. I want you to reflect upon a theology of dress. If God were to clothe you, what garments would he place upon you? Uh, what would that symbolize? What garments do you need <laughs> from God? What would you like to be clothed in? What would those clothes look like and what would they symbolize? So um, we can all play dress up for, for our next gathering, but I'm curious to see how you might think through that notion of, um, of what those garments would be for you. What, they, what interior aspect of yourself would they bring out? Nicola, please. Last week, you asked us to contemplate the kiss, Jesus, kiss of God, and to come up with a prayer around that concept. So I would love to hear people discuss that. Yes. And you know what? Uh, just to be fair, I'll go back. You're absolutely right. It was the week before. I think I forgot. Um, so what arises for you when you reflect on Christ as God's kiss to all creation, I asked you to meditate on how that manifests in you and perhaps to write a prayer that expresses Christ as the divine kiss. Thank you for that, Nicola. I appreciate the reminder. I must have been the last week that I had forgotten. So let me open the floor. Uh, certainly, if any of you have written anything you'd like to share, I'd love to hear it. Kathy, good to see you. <laughs> Uh, Kathy, sorry, you need to unmute that pesky mute button. There you go. Well, I did unmute, but something remuted oh, something, it. Okay. <laughs> anyway, thank you. Sure. Um, I, I did not write a prayer, but I did struggle with it and literally struggle with it. And I'd like your feedback. And this may just come from my lack of spiritual maturity and, and thoughtfulness, but with, with your assignment, what weighed on me most that sat in tension with the, the Christ kiss was Judas's kiss. Mm. And, and, I, and I feel real, that tension feels very important for me, but I, I'm really stuck and don't know how to work with it. And I didn't want to just write a prayer because it would just be all in my head. I, I feel like there's something really important in, in some part of me wanting to pair those for for my prayer so if you could give me any insight or way a way of being with that to help move through that i'd appreciate it yeah let me just start with a comment you don't strike me at all as somebody who lacks in spiritual maturity so let me just put that out there from the get-go um but any your question i think it betrays that i mean there's a degree to which it reveals really that that you know the tension you're feeling there in that experience of being of, of, in a sense, God being betrayed with a kiss and, uh, and the very one who we're claiming is the kiss of God is now betrayed by a kiss, right? There's something very powerful, I think, in that attention that you're feeling. And to be honest, it, you know, the, I hadn't paired the two, they had, it hadn't crossed my mind. So it's, um, it, I'm just hearing it now and finding that I have to agree with you that there is a, uh, attention, but for me, as kind of beautiful tension. Um, so what I'm about to say is potentially half baked, and I'll, I'll maybe try to fix it later. But what's coming to me most is that passage 
uh, that, that I cited from Paul, that Christ comes to us while we were still sinners, as it were, right? That, that it's precisely that Judas represents humans, be, humanity's betrayal of love, uh, of God, of the incarnation, that what is personalized between the two of them is really a microcosm of the macrocosmic experience of God's profound compassion um, and, um, and love, even in the midst of betrayal, um, even in the midst of our turning away. And that in many ways is the story that the prophets are telling over and over and over and over again, right? Um, Israel, you know what God expects. God demands justice. God demands love. God demands compassion. So you have to turn and repent of all of those betrayals. Um, so the, those are the thoughts that are coming to me, but I would bet there's a lot we could unpack in your sort of that spiritual or uh, emotional tension you're feeling there, because it is quite profound as we think it through. But those are some of my initial thoughts that it's the microcosm of the larger macrocosmic experience of incarnation. Thank you. That, that really touched me. Tears, I mean, you probably can't see what tears are just flowing down my face. Oh, so, thanks, yeah. Kathy. Yeah, no, it's beautiful. And I would really encourage you to keep seeking in your own heart what that tension looks like uh, and what's what it's saying to you, because uh, it speaks precisely around what I try to talk about in the book about an embodied reading right? That's an embodied reading. When you feel in your own body, there's something going on here. It's not just a thought or a concept or an idea, but your body as scripture is revealing something or trying to. So to move into the silence of the flesh, into the silence of the heart and see what's there, I would encourage you to, to stick with that for a bit. And I'd love to hear what you come back with. <laughs> so thank you, Kathy. Um, Linda, please. Yeah. Um I um to I did struggle not struggle I really actually loved it um, writing a poem but I'm feeling shy about <laughs> sharing it I want to work on it a little um, sure. for me the the issue um, that I kept coming up with is that that God could not kiss creation because creation was the kiss you know that mm -hmm. there's no um, yeah I'm just gonna say that <laughs> it's very beautiful. Um, and is that, if I can ask, is that sort of what's emerging in your prayer or your, or your, my, yeah, my prayer poem. <laughs> yes, yeah, it pr is. Mm -hmm. Good. Well, I, you know, I would love to hear that, um, um, when it's done because that's okay. a beautiful insight and, you know, like, as there's so many things in, in, in the spiritual tradition, uh, we often have to be comfortable with the fact that there isn't necessarily one way to skin a cat to use that term, but that very often multiple, truths can kind of be held even with intention of one another and reveal something. And even the gospels themselves, the wisdom of the church to incorporate four versions of one gospel that are so distinctive is, is in a sense um, a perpetual joke from the early church onto the rest of us to say, you deal with the tension. You know, we're, we're not going to give you a, a simple answer. There are things that feel frankly irreconcilable here. And now figure it out, live with it. Like let that tension continue to speak to you and don't be too quick to settle on one thing. And I think with when we're struggling with uh, what it means to live a contemplative life, part of that spiritual maturity comes about by being able to hold in complexity multiple things at once, even when they sometimes feel complementary but contradictory or so forth. So I would really love to hear what it sounds like from say your heart, Linda, that creation is the kiss. I mean, I think that could be a beautiful compliment to what I'm trying to suggest here. So thank you for that. Um, okay, Joy, uh, please. Um, yeah, I just talked about kissing. So um, sure, go right ahead. Oh, okay. Oh, I love kissing. So many different kinds of kissing. My daughter on her cheek and smelling the essence of her being. Kissing and hugging my friends who have my back. The passionate sexual kiss of my lover. The divine soft kiss of Christ. Oh, what ecstatic and divine love. Absolutely stunning. 
you know what I love, Joy, is your um, candid admission that not all kisses are the same. <laughs> and we shy away often, um, unfortunately, from the passionate kiss, right, uh, of God as lover and beloved, uh, merely as God as parent or father, as it were. Um, and that, that tension has come out in, in history as, as the love of God being agape, and yet so met, which is this sort of love that only God can love, which is this sort of beautiful, pure um, love of God that we are incapable of returning, this infinite love. But also the mystics have explored God's love as eros, that love that is... Um, typically the love of lovers uh, that we see, for example, in the Canticle of Canticles or the Song of Songs, which, by the way, is the, the book in the scriptures that within Judaism and Christianity has most lent itself to mystical interpretation. So it's so interesting that the, the mystics have seen, rather than shied away from, this expression of passionate love as an expression of divine love and not merely agopic love, which is the safer, more distant, purer, uh, disembodied love. So thank you for bringing that beautiful element into it because I think there's something that in fact is true for most of us to experience in that deep, intimate love, passionate love, something of grace and something of divine love, but yet we've been taught to shy, shy away from that for something more platonic and pure and de de disembodied or desexualized. So thank you for that beautiful gamut of the various ways in which uh, we know the kiss of God. Beautiful. Um, Richard, please. This, let's start with, this prayer just came to me about kiss. Oh God, I build walls of defense against the shattering of your love. Please kiss me from inside those walls and kiss the walls of my pain that they crumble in surrender and sweet surrender to the realization that in this moment, no wall is needed. Amen. Richard, you're, thank you for that, especially since it was so fresh off the page, as it were. I appreciate the insight. You know, what, what came to mind is that beautiful experience I hope most of us had um, as a child when you scrape your knee, you know, skin your knee and your mother kisses it. Um, it's, I mean, there's, there's no scientific reason why that should make any difference whatsoever. And yet it does somehow, because somehow the kiss itself betrays, or it, to use a better term, it reveals um, a love um, that somehow has an effect on us, right? And, and this is really what the church means when we talk about blessing. When we bless something, we are in a, in, in a sense changing, uh, transforming our relationship with that. Right. If we bless water, it isn't to deny that as as the creature of God, that all water isn't blessed. I mean, all water is holy water because it was made by the divine. Right. So uh, so what are we doing when we bless water, for example? Um, we're altering our conscious relationship with it We're we're seeing its blessedness and allowing its blessedness to be revealed to us anew to speak again on the microcosmic about the macrocosmic. And this kiss of a, of a mother on a skinned knee reveals something far beyond the physical kiss, which has no scientific basis in helping at all, but yet does, right? It brings a degree of comfort and an expression of love that raises us and lifts us and has a healing blessing effect on us. Um, it's a beautiful thing, uh, you know. So thank you, Richard. The, the idea of that mother's kiss on a skin knee is, came to me when you talked about God kissing you from the inside those walls and breaking them down. Somehow that kiss penetrates that pain, I think. It's a beautiful um, divine motherly image for us. Thank you. Christine, please. This is my prayer to Jesus. <laughs> Kiss me with the kisses of your mouth, however you come to me. 
With the caress of a zephyr, with the radiance of the morning, with the sound that makes me tremble, with the captivity of loving freedom, with the warmth of a baby asleep upon me, with the lazy infilling of coiling honey filling all of me and overflowing and spreading across the floor, with the awe of distant star clusters and dancing galaxies, with delight to find you here before me, always anticipating my arrival. Kiss me with the kisses of your mouth by candlelight in a shady glen, in the glare of midday or twilight's magic splendor, groaning, grieving, become gratitude in your company. Your unsung symphony attunes my heart to yours. I would follow you, but you carry me. Dispelling all doubt, my life is yours. My heart is yours. My breath is yours. Kiss me with the kisses of your mouth. Amen. Amen. It's beautiful. Did you write that this week? Well, wow, that's beautiful. Thank you, Christine. It reminds me of the um, uh, the Gnostic Gospel, where where we have that provocative line <laughs> um, about Jesus kissing uh, Mary Magdalene. Um, it's a beautiful, eye, but th then there's a section missing, and we don't know more than that. <laughs> Um, but in many ways, uh, you express in that beautiful voice of perhaps Mary Magdalene speaking for all of us. It's beautiful. Thank you. So, um, today, um, I have to close right about now uh, in preparation for something I have in just a bit of time from now, mid morning. Um, but I just want to thank you for, um, Nicola, thank you for reminding me that I had indeed posted. It. <laughs> um, and for all of you who have shared such beautiful um, poems and prayers, um, they're stunning. So thank you for gifting me with that this morning. And we will continue uh, next week at the same time and uh, we'll move through another few uh, paragraphs. And I look forward to welcoming you back then. But in the meantime, I urge you this week to um, see in the, the various ways in which God continues to kiss you and to embrace you and to rush out to greet you and to clothe you. Um, and I'll be interested in hearing what those um, the theology of dress is uh, for all of you when we get back. So please stay safe and be healthy. Um, remember, you're the mountain, not the weather. Uh, hold on to that. And, um, and I bid you the peace of Christ, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Go in peace. And I'll see you guys uh, next Saturday. God bless you. Ben and Christ in it. Thank you, Father. You're welcome. Thank you. Of course. Thank you.